Thanks very much for inviting me to be here. I've been um, giving a talk for a while um, that's been evolving during this year, and it's, and it's about fast delivery because um, if you go to a, a, a development team or a management tr team and you say, would you like to slow down the pace of development of your products? They all say, no, I don't want to do that. Well, would you like to speed it up then? Yes, we would like to do that. So it's one of those universal goods. Everyone wants to speed things up. And one of the things that uh, I learned, I was the architect at Netflix for a long time, was Netflix just optimized everything for speed of delivery. So I'm sort of taking what I've learned from that and talking about it. So I'm going to talk a little bit, I've got sort of some time talking about that. And then at the end, I've got some sort of ideas and things where I think um, so that actually, you know, talk about what Nginx might mean or ways that we could use uh, Nginx to do that. So this, the first part of this isn't really about Nginx or, 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 the, or that kind of ecosystem, but, it, but it's something that I'm finding resonates a lot with people as they try and work out how to go faster in the current environment. And I'll start off by just giving a, a quick summary of the talks I've been giving. So about over the last four years, I've been out giving talks about the Netflix architecture and um, it was kind of baffling late adopters as a service, mostly. <laughs> People's sort of stunned in comprehension was the opening thing. And then it sort of worked through a sort of a sequence. So giving the same talk over the years, the, the reaction changed. So the first reaction we got was people thought we were just crazy. In 20, 2009, we were running uh, back-end, um, compute-intensive, non-customer-facing stuff to just try out cloud, so movie encoding, things like that. Um, 2010, the front-end moved to the cloud, and we were running it on AWS. Um, and at the beginning of 2010, the first piece moved to AWS, and at the end, it was all running on AWS. At that time, the CDN was mostly running on commercial CDNs using sort of spare capacity that they had in the evenings um, because Netflix's bandwidth wasn't, was, was building really fast, but it was still something you could run on, on a commercial CDN. 2011, we moved the back end from uh, running, you know, the system of record was Oracle and stuff in the data center with all this front end in the cloud and it was all sort of the, the links between them kept breaking and there were all kinds of things. But we basically moved the back end to the cloud in 2011. And um, people were kind of at that point said, okay, this is interesting but your guys are unicorns and uh, no one else will ever want to do anything like this. You're special in some way. Um, in 2012, it moved, the conversation moved on to, well, actually, we do kind of like the way that looks. We're getting our heads around this cloud-native architecture, and it's, got, it's resilient, it scales, it's very fast to develop things. Um, but we can't figure out how to get there from here. It looks so alien and so different to what we were currently doing. Um, but in 2012, Netflix started open sourcing its code base really, really seriously. So there are now something like 46 projects on, on GitHub that Netflix has put out there. And, Something like half to two thirds of them are the cloud platform that lets you do this, and there's a bunch of other stuff there. And then last year, uh, I'd go out doing roughly the same talk. We'd say, I'm actually using this platform. Can you explain more about how to use it, giving us feedback on it? So it became the conversation had just moved to the point where, okay, they'd accepted it. And there are a substantial number of companies out there using pieces of the Netflix platform, little companies like IBM, who, who decided to use it to build out some services in SoftLayer. Um, some people handling very, very high level internet of things like um, in the, you know, with, with huge scale, collecting uh, data from people uh, and whatever. So there's, there's a bunch of useful things there and a bunch of other sites you, you, can, you can go look up on the, the GitHub site. There's a bunch of public you know, people that use this. But what did I learn there? And there's, there's, this is really the, the key thing. Netflix was optimizing for speed in the marketplace. It's a small company, it's got lots of big competitors. How do you win? Well, you win by dodging around and these big lumbering competitors can't move as fast as you, so whenever they line up to take you out, you're not there anymore. You've moved on, you're running around, and you're growing like crazy, and you're learning about your customers faster than they can. So that, that's the speed that matters. You get to that by taking friction out of product development. That works by having a high trust, low process, um, you know, sort of organization with no handoffs between teams. I'll talk a bit more about that later, what that looks like. And that's built on a freedom and responsibility culture where you trust individual engineers' judgment. And if you have somebody in your team and you can't trust their judgment, why do you even employ them, right? That doesn't make sense. So you basically build a team where everyone ends up trusting everybody else's judgment, and that becomes a strong binding thing for the organization. And you, you reject anybody that shows that they can't handle that. Um, 
And then to speed things up, you also move things out that are generic. So you know, don't build your own data centers because Amazon can do that quicker. This is about doing things faster rather than th doing things more efficiently. Right? The, the, if you concentrate too much on efficiency, you're usually externalizing a bunch of things that slow you down that you maybe didn't realize. So, so if you hear somebody say, I'm doing this because it's more efficient, you say, well, it's probably slower. You're probably slowing somebody else down that you don't realize. And that's what grinds everything to a halt, is all these efficiency things. So it's not that you want to waste things, but you should optimize for speed first and then try to be efficient without slowing anything down. So that becomes a secondary thing with this constraint of just making sure you don't slow things down. So it isn't quite as efficient, but uh, Roy Rappaport of Netflix was on stage yesterday and got a question, isn't this inefficient? He says, yeah, but the end result of this is $1.8 million per employee of revenue. <laughs> right? I can be relatively inefficient if what I'm doing gets me a huge amount of dollars per, per employee, because now I'm optimizing on making that number bigger rather than saving money, right? Do you grow the business to be more efficient rather than and by going faster? So it's kind of turning it around a little bit. If you keep optimizing, then you're slowing yourself down and you get less revenue per employee, and then you're in this debt spiral where you have to save more money and you're kind of going slower and slower. Um, as an architect at Netflix, uh, what I was really doing was looking for the emergent patterns, looking for the stuff that worked. We had a large team of very experienced engineers. We had. If you want to discuss object models and object modeling, we had two guys that were at Xerox in the early 1980s inventing that stuff, right? And, and you could have a good discussion with them. So we, we had all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds. We synthesized everything, and what I did was I documented it, and what I, one of the reasons I talked about it externally at conferences was to test these ideas in public, and also to cause the ideas to feed back into our, our own engineering organization. Because when they see something in a presentation, it kind of gets this extra, kind of it's blessed sort of feeling, and you pay more attention to it than if it was just a slide deck on an internal wiki, right? It shouldn't make any difference, but it does. Um, open sourcing things also creates more weight for them for reuse internally. It's sort of one of those psychological things. Um, and then the other thing is to, with using cloud is that things, you can use it to just speed up stuff you're going to do anyway. I need to deploy 50 machines in some configuration to get something done. Okay, you can probably do that faster if you're making a series of API calls than if you're arguing people about which rack to put it in in the data center. So that's just faster. But you can do things that you could not have done before. So Netflix, is, all its engineering is in the US, in, in, you know, at 60 miles south of here in Los Gatos. Um, we have no engineering elsewhere in the world, but it's running a global infrastructure. So, you know, I think we should try having a few machines in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Yeah, let's try that, okay? A few hours later, we have 100 machines in Brazil. Don't try that with a regular, like, IT department because they'll go crazy because we only need them for a week to find out it didn't really help, so we turned them off again, right? That, normally, that would be, hey, we go and hire somebody in Brazil and figure out which building to put these machines in and ship them to Brazil, and six months later, you have your 100 machines and you try it for a week and say, oh, no, it didn't work. Uh, that's not, that's, that doesn't make sense, right? So there's these things that would be impossible to do that you can do instantly, and that's why it's faster and why I had so much fun doing infrastructure experiments. You can stand up configurations, huge global configurations for a few hours, and you know, things that would be multi-million dollar installations and run them for long enough to figure out whether it works, shut it down, tinker with it. So the, the ability to learn operations infrastructure and benchmarking things is fantastic. So this is what's going on with cloud and enterprise. Uh, this is from Simon Wardley, and, and this is what Netflix was, was doing in 2009. We were a bit ahead of the rest of the world. So big enterprises were ignoring us, and then the rest of the world started doing it. They started paying attention. They started saying, no, we're not gonna do cloud. We still like our Blackberries, and we don't want to do cloud. There's a very strong correlation, by the way, between people that think Blackberries are a good idea and people that don't use cloud. Very, just an observation. Um, <laughs> they're kind of the tale of the late adopters. Um, and then they say, I said, no, damn it. And then they went, oh, no, and then realized that everyone was doing this. Then went, oh, oh crap, and I've got to do it now. Um, so I was off here. This is my, my Twitter icon. It's the Cloudicorn. Uh, Adrian Co is my, my Twitter handle. Um, and there's this big collision now where enterprise IT is suddenly rushing into cloud and figuring it out. And so I decided to leave Netflix and join Battery Ventures, a venture capital company, where we are funding companies who are working in this space and are particularly looking for people who are trying to help these enterprises deal with the fact that they've suddenly started to adopt cloud and none of their tooling works and they don't know what they're doing. And, and I've just come from the DevOps Enterprise Conference just up the road. 
um, where it's actually amazing how many big companies are actually working on this stuff and are using cloud and are using DevOps, but they are doing a huge internal transformation and the, the leaders of that are, are talking about it up the road. The DOES14 is the Twitter hashtag if you want to tap into the conversation there. They have Nordstrom, right? Nordstrom, fairly old, kind of, you know, heavyweight company. They have lots of mainframes, if you didn't know. Um, they, they, the, the, present, the, the talk that was up earlier today, um, one of the opening keynotes, she's saying, their VP of IT or whatever, she said that they've decided to change from optimizing for efficiency to optimizing for speed. And that just like summarizes it in a nutshell. All of these big enterprises realized that they were trying to be more efficient and it was slowing them down. When they optimize for speed, they're more competitive and then they can get their mobile app out once a month instead of once a year and they can get all their stuff done much more quickly. So what's going on right now is that really this is the year that enterprises adopted cloud. I mean, they may not have finished adopting it, but most big enterprises now have AWS and Azure as their you know, strategic vendor. You know, they're on that strategic vendor list. They've got the corporate agreement in place and they're starting to do the rollout. And a year ago, that wasn't really true. And I picked up this tweet from Lydia Leong, who's uh, the, one of the key analysts at Gartner. She was at a symposium a week or so ago and having one-on-ones with her key customers and saying, you know, what are you doing? How are you using cloud? You know, this is kind of what a difference a year makes. Everyone's already comfortable using IA in infrastructure as a service, lots of Amazon, some Azure, right? This is what I was seeing earlier this year. This is just confirmation of it. So the world's changing, and you know, the question is, how can you go and figure that out? And if you're, if you're a small company, how do you take advantage of this? You know, the other is the incumbents that are built in, that all of, everything's built around the old way of doing things, but how can the disruptors take advantage of it? So what is it that's different about an incumbent and a disruptor? And it really comes down to this. It isn't what you don't know that gets you trouble, it's what you know that ain't so, right? You're a big incumbent, you've got billions of dollars of revenue based on some assumptions that you made years ago, and you've optimized your business model around those assumptions and everything's going to be good, except that assumption isn't true anymore and you're optimizing for something that's actually wrong. And if somebody sneaks in and says, you know what? If I change that assumption, I have a different optimization. I can be, you know, some of the speed ups they're talking about at the DevOps Enterprise Summit, it was, this isn't like 20% faster, it's 20 times faster, 100 times faster. You know, 100 times more releases a year, uh, 100, 100 times less defects. Uh, in the releases, you know, massive increases. And it, the, the improvements are so dramatic that they start a little project and then they go, management are going, crap, this, is, this really works, right? The DevOps works, agile, you know, the agile stuff works. These big waterfall systems they had don't work. Um, the last keynote last night was from the Department of Homeland Security, right? The guy that does green card processing. Well, some of you have probably dealt with that. I actually renewed my green card on Monday afternoon. Um, and he's in there doing agile <laughs> and, and taking this massively impossible process where the, the, everything took months or yeah, years to do and doing stuff in weeks instead. It's quite incredible. So, but this is, this is the assumption. The old assumption is that process prevents problems and if you're doing something and it goes wrong, you create a process step and a handoff and a rule that says don't do that again because that's a bad thing, right? And so you end up building up this scar tissue processes. If you look at the process, the way you do stuff, and you can actually see all the things that ever went wrong are embedded in that process. And if you look at the laws of countries, you see everything that every scandal that ever happened in that country, there's a law against it. But you look at a different country, they had a different set of scandals, so their laws are different, right? But you take the, the total set of all these things, it's like everything that ever went wrong is embedded somewhere. HR manuals are very similar. You know, every time an employee did something bad, they put it in an HR manual, let's do this. Um, so Netflix doesn't have an HR manual, it has a phrase. There is no book, there is nothing else that says, the phrase is, act in Netflix's best interest. That's it, that's the policy for expenses, for HR, for everything. If you couldn't figure out how to interpret that phrase in whatever situation you're in, you don't have enough judgment to work here. That's it, right, it's very simple. And every now and again, somebody kind of steps over the line and they get fired, right? And, and it's ha I, I know of a couple of cases where that happened, right? But almost everyone else goes, you know what? I, I, I can figure out how to act in Netflix's best interest, and that's all you need to do. So there's these big scar tissue processes. So how do you break out of that? How, if you're a big co old company trying to reorganize yourself, how do you do it? Well, there's a couple of books here. Um, 1984, 
Um, the Goal, somebody, I see a few people nodding. This is a very well-known book. If you ever did an MBA or you know somebody did an MBA, it was probably on the reading list. It's a standard management book, Theory of Constraints. It's a novel about a guy whose factory is about to go out of business and be shut down, and he has to save the factory by making it efficient. So it's about process control and automation and building hardware kind of stuff. Um, the DevOps Enterprise Summit is run by Gene King, and it's basically an outgrowth of this Phoenix Project book. He's running the book, he wrote the book, and it sort of created such a conversation that this book, it was somebody yesterday from Target, right? One of the ops guys at Target bought over 20 copies of this book, uh, gave it to all his staff, made it a required reading, and then at an offsite, they role played scenes from the book. It's like, <laughs> it's just, that's probably going a bit too far, right? <laughs> I don't necessarily say you go that far, but, but the Phoenix Project is a novel about DevOps. It's a novel about a company that doesn't know how to build software where there's open warfare between the development, the operations, the security teams, management. Everyone isn't just, doesn't just hate each other. They're actively subverting each other's projects. That's kind of everything that ever went wrong in IT is somewhere in this book. It's actually a horror story, and it's quite uncomfortable to read. You're, you're about halfway through the book, it's quite depressing. But it's so depressing that in the book, the, uh, the head of security actually loses his mind and disappears, and they find him like a week later, drunk in a gutter somewhere, uh, and they have to kind of bring, bring him back into the fold. He, he has a nervous breakdown, right? So that's kind, of, that's kind of the low point of the book. But then, you know, thanks to the miracles of DevOps and Kanban and nice stuff like this, they gradually dig their way out of it, and they eventually learn how to how a, you know, a typical Midwestern manufacturing company that, isn't, doesn't, that you know, makes parts for car stores, that, you know, car parts stores, that's the parts, for, yeah, car parts, like Cragen or something like that, whatever it's called, O'Reilly, those, those kind of companies. It's one of those companies, and they didn't think they needed to be good at software until they realized that they did, and then they figured out how to do it, and then they could be competitive, and the Phoenix Project is the project's gonna save them, make them competitive, and at the end it all becomes happy, right? But, and this, is, this, is, this quote is the quote, I, I helped uh, review the book and I put this quote on the back so my name's next to it. So it's the IT Swamp Daining, ran, Draining Manual for anyone neck deep in alligator. It says, how to dig yourself out of this hole, right? So let's look at product development processes. What, what should it look like? And this is kind of the, uh, the Netflix way of doing it. You're, you're, you're going on an OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. The first thing you're going to try and do is get your innovation right. What's the innovation process at your company? Can anyone at the company say, this is broken, and I can, I'm gonna, I can see it's broken, and I'm gonna start a project to go fix it. That's the innovation process. I see a customer pain point. There's a sign-up flow where you know, too many customers are dropping off. I, I'm gonna go and investigate that, so I'm going to go and do some analysis. I'm gonna grab some log files. I'm actually gonna do some big data analytics. I'm gonna ask questions no one has ever asked before, looking at data that no one has ever looked at before. You know, grab, that's why unstructured processing of massive log files matters. You want to quickly figure out what to do about it. And then you go plan a response, just do it. Uh, that's the culture, I can go fix this thing. Right? I'm responsible for this general area of the thing. I don't need to get management approval for every different change I put to the website. So I go figure it out, but I do share the plans. It's like, I'm about to make this change. I think this is a good idea, we should go do it. You share it, but you're not asking for permission. You're just sharing that you're doing it. And then use cloud to do an incremental to feature, to get this incremental feature deployed. It's automatically deployed, but it's launched behind an A-B test. So now you're running your hypothesis against the old way of doing it. And you side by side that for however long it takes until you have enough data to say, yes, this definitely, you know, my conversion flow through sign up is now, you know, 70% instead of 50%, right? Whatever it is, whatever improvement you can do. Uh, you can measure differences of the, in retention of a fraction of a percent if you do this right. You know, Netflix will roll out a feature that causes, you know, 0.1% improvement in retention and they have enough scientifically, you know, statistically valid things to say that that is actually you know, a high confidence. That's a, that's a significant improvement. You know, there's a confidence intervals that don't overlap. There's a statistically valid improvement, and they keep putting all these tiny percentages on, and the cumulative improvement on that over time is what makes Netflix get better and better. So then you measure customers again. And then you also jump around a bit. This isn't just one loop. You, the question is, how fast, how agile can you be? How fast can you bounce around this, this sequence of things to learn and get better? And what can you learn about your customers? So this is what it's all about. This is the speed part, right? 
what can you learn, how fast can you learn about your customers. If you're learning about your customers 10 times faster than your competition, you will end up winning. I mean, it's really hard not to win if you've got that many data points and everyone else is making stuff up and finding out months later that they were wrong, right? So to do that, though, you've got a few problems because you've got your company's usually organized like this. You've got a product manager. They have meetings with user interface designers and they have meetings with dev. And then they throw code over and have meetings with QA and the DBAs. And, the sys and they fire tickets to sysadmin and netadmins and sanadmins. And this thing runs end to end and takes forever to go. But if you want to speed this up, you quite often hear companies, well, we're going to create this like startup-like team off on the side, and they're going to buy their own hardware and do their own thing because they need to go faster. And you kind of see that attempt. So that looks a bit like this. You basically spun off a little thing on the side, or you acquired a little startup, and you have them sitting on the side running on their own infrastructure. Um, and you end up with these monolithic deliveries where everything is soup to nuts for the whole end-to-end -to -end thing, but it's not very efficient. And it's not very agile in the end. So what you really want to do is pull together a product team that is all the software pieces of this, <clears throat> have a platform team and an API, and make everything API driven. But, but this is an organization. The organization now is, is that the management teams sit at this side going across, not above going down. You don't have a management team that does dev, and a management team that does ops, and a management team that does product. You have a management team that does this feature, product through, operate, th through development, another team that does this feature, product managers through development, through everything they need to deploy it using the APIs that the platform provides. And you have a platform team that's sitting there providing layers of platform above the other infrastructure. So in Netflix's case, most of that platform team was AWS in Seattle, and then we had our own layers of platform on top of that, right? But if you're running in-house cloud, then you're, 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 you have the whole thing in-house. And I don't really care whether you run cloud public or internally. The main thing is it should be API-driven, self-service, and automatable. So DevOps is a reorg, and we're seeing some of those reorgs happen in big companies where they're finally realizing that they have to set up their organizations differently to go faster. And then let's just skip through this a little bit. This is what a monolithic delivery looks like. And the problem with it is every time there's a bug in one developer's code, every other developer blocks, and everything they do has to wait until that bug's fixed. So this, and, and when you get to operations, you find, oh, it didn't work in production. Again, you have to hold the release while you fix the one thing. So this is fine when there's a small team, a handful of developers, and it's the normal way you should start, right? If you've just got a handful of people, it makes sense. But once you get bigger and bigger, if you get to 50 to 100 people in a team, that one bug is stopping 99 people's work from hitting customers and making the world better and learning. And it slows everything down. So Netflix was built this way. The DVD version of Netflix was a monolithic Java app about five years ago. We decided that have over 100 engineers, it just didn't work. We couldn't get this thing out. So we went to a, a, a distributed microservice kind of approach where you've got lots of release plans and lots of independent services that are updating whenever they want to. Um, and the teams don't have to talk to each other. And they can use different technologies. And the deployment is you know, using a standard container. Netflix has been historically been using the, the AMI, you know, the, the building machine images, and using that as the container. Anything you put a machine image, we know how to put in production. Don't really care what it's built out of. So it could be, you know, it could be Python, or it could be uh, some JVM-based thing, or whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, and when you get a bug in one thing, you just re-release that one thing. Um, nowadays, Docker is you know, a much faster way of doing it. So the Netflix thought we were pretty good. It's like, you could do a build in a few minutes, because we had a nice Jenkins pipeline. And then we'd bake it into an AMI, which took a few minutes. Then we could launch it on AWS in a few minutes. So in maybe 10 minutes, your code was running in either t in test, basically. And then you could push it to production in a few more minutes. That's pretty, that's pretty slick. But what's happened this year is that Docker came along, where now your compile time is seconds if you write stuff in Go. Somebody said they had a complete API server. It takes 400 milliseconds to compile from source, 400 milliseconds. So there's a, OK, I like that. I have to have a Jenkins build system if it takes 400 milliseconds and say, go build, right? Um, and then you put it in a Docker container. That takes a few seconds, maybe. And then you launch that in, in test and, you know, on, on your machine, on your laptop, which takes seconds. And then you say, yeah, that worked. Let's put it in test. A few seconds later, it's running in test. Oh, good. Let's put it in production. A few seconds later, it's running in production. So now, does anyone see why developers like this? <laughs> Right? So a developer starts working in stuff that takes, you know, say, 10 seconds for the full pipeline of everything. And then they go, oh, you know, you just come back to the old world where it's going to take hours to do everything. No, 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 I'm going to do it this way. Right? 
So this is one of the reasons Docker's become so viral, is because it does stuff in seconds that used to take minutes or hours or days or weeks to do. And, and that is incredibly addictive once you get to it. And there's this emerging market. So Docker's kind of a done deal right now. Everyone's agreed to do Docker. Um, but how you orchestrate lots of Docker containers together and how you do sort of more complex production things and how you move the storage around with the container, there's a huge argument going up. There's lots of startups playing in that space. I just listed a few companies that are trying to work on this. Google's all over it. Cloud Foundry, Pivotal are all over it. Uh, Ericsson bought AppSera, and they've got lots of policy management if you want to do security stuff. Mesos is sort of in this space. And there's many, many more, right? So this is, as a venture capital, you know, working in the VC community, this is fascinating. I get to go hear what all of these different companies are doing and try and figure out which ones are going to win and you know, try to fund the ones that, that win. So this is, this is cool. And the other fun thing about Docker, it wasn't on anybody's 2014 plan, right? There, there was basically a few people tinkering with it last year. came out of nowhere. So everyone is just trying to digest it with no real sort of planning. So it will be on everyone's 2015 plan. So this is what's really going on. Cost and size and risk of change reduced, rate of change increased. And this is really the disruptor, continuous delivery of microservices. And just to kind of explain a bit about what I mean by microservices, loosely coupled means I can update them independently. Now, if all your microservices took the same database and you have to change the schema, that isn't loosely coupled. Quite often you get database coupling. You have to split your databases apart too and denormalize them, but that's a little more complicated. And then the bounded context. So people say, well, how big should my microservice be? How should I draw the boundaries? There's a book, <laughs> Domain Driven Design. It's a fairly sophisticated book, but this is like the job of management. Like, how do you break the total product into the groups? And how do you break the groups into teams and have individual people? And how do you decide which developer works on what if you're a manager? That's something that managers need to be good at, decomposing problems. And this is about getting the domains and the domain boundaries right. I won't explain it, but. Eric Evans' Domain Driven Design is, is one of the best books on that, and he talks particularly about this idea of bounded context. All right, so let's just go off and talk a little bit, sort of get a bit closer to things that are more related to Nginx. Um, so Netflix released all these open source projects. Um, they're basically cloud native. It's got all this nice immutable code, auto scaling. It's globally distributed, and all the projects are up on GitHub. And then. GitHub now is, is where you go. So if you, if, you know, when Netflix hires developers, they say, what's your GitHub ID? You want to read your code? We don't have to scribble stuff on a whiteboard now. You can go read it on GitHub. OK, I like this guy. You know, he's been contributing to the right kind of projects, whatever. Um, if you don't have a GitHub ID, why not? Right? Is there a real You've got to have a good reason why not at this point. Um, but then the other thing is that Netflix Netflix's own GitHub account is now an attractor for interesting developers who've got, who like to work on open source projects. So it became both ways. Um, and you're creating ecosystems around these platforms. So what about Nginx? Uh, and, you know, Netflix is a big user of Nginx. It was the, the first customer of the Nginx as a company. So what does it do with that? Well, this is uh, last spring's US bandwidth numbers, right? So wh what do we see here? Well, there's a Netflix sitting there, right? Um, there's two things on here. There's two places. So upstream, you have, this is traffic going from customers to Netflix, right? It's actually going to AWS, and it's going in through the Amazon ELBs. And this is a lot of traffic, right? So this is probably the, the, you know, one of the biggest sources of traffic for, for the ELB load balancer on AWS. Um, now, the, there's a lot less bandwidth on the left than the right because there's less data going up than down, right? Um, this is OpenConnect, which is the Netflix CDN. They, they outgrew the ability to run on the public CDNs. They ended up just generating more bandwidth than they could possibly deal with, and it was, they needed a much simpler CDN. So I think there may be somebody from Netflix here. around. I, told, I was told somebody was going to be in, in, visiting the, the, the show. But, um, if you want to know about, more about OpenConnect, talk to the Netflix people about it. But the Net, OpenConnect is a box of hard, box of disks with Nginx, and that's about it. There's no business logic on it. You don't deploy code to it. There's some code that runs on Amazon, which controls and sequences and points customers at it. And then it's a static content delivery service with a multi-gigabyte file that you're just doing HTTP range gets. That's it. That, that's the protocol. And 
the way it's set up is, is very, very slick. But there's just these boxes of disks, and they scattered them all over the world. And there was a photograph recently of when they were launched in France. They put a terabit of capacity in France in the central Paris Internet Exchange. There's like two racks, terabit switch on top. So says, yeah, we're, we're in France now. Have a terabit. Right? Uh, and they, so they have lots of terabits scattered around the world. So that's, that is a lot of bandwidth. I mean, there's more things going through Nginx than that. But um, you can go look at Open Connect on the Netflix site. There's all the hardware specs. And, and the fact that it runs Nginx is listed there. So this ELB piece, um, so you're probably aware, like Christmas Eve a few years ago, Netflix had a problem. It was caused by the ELB getting corrupted. One of those classic things that, you know, has anyone ever done this? I'm just going to mess with this test machine. Oops, no, that was the production machine. Oh. <laughs> Except they didn't realize that that would happen because the guy that broke it didn't realize that, it, that he was doing it on the production machine until several hours into the outage, which is part of the problem. Anyway, so AWS had corru randomly corrupted all their ELBs because the control plane database got scribbled over by somebody that, that should have been talking to the test machine and was accidentally connected to production. Now, doing that on Christmas Eve is also a bad thing. Just go home. Like, don't, no, don't mess with machines just before holidays. It's like Friday afternoon rule. Right? Um, anyway, so the result of that was Netflix went, eh, I'm not sure. Maybe we should just build our own ELB. Right? And how would you do that? Right? Uh, and we actually went some way down the road to building it. Because also, the problem with the ELB is it's within a region. So there's an ELB within US East. There's another one in US West, another one in Europe. And you want to connect customers to different places, which means you need sort of DNS management across regions. And Amazon doesn't provide that. I mean, they provide DNS, but they don't provide a load balancer that goes across regions. So we actually started building a globally distributed load balancer. And we were going to use Nginx as part of that. But what we actually built in, I guess it was the first part of 2012, 2013, maybe it was 2013, was, yeah, it was early, yeah, early last year. Um, was a thing called Denominator, which is a DNS management layer. It abstracts a bunch of different DNS vendors into a standard object model. It's a Java application library and a command line. It's a very nice command line. It's very simple to use that you can use to control it. And it has backends for five or six different DNS vendors. So it does Route 53, Dyn, Ultra, I think the Rackspace, and OpenStack. And it's got a built-in mock, so you can do testing against the mock and try things out. Um, and you can easily add more things to it. So at the front end, you want to be able to route your customers' endpoints to a particular place. I mean, that, everyone does that anyway. You go hand edit the web page, and you file a ticket to your network guy, and he pokes at the DNS vendor. Then you say, OK, when we have a failover from the East Coast to the West Coast, we need to move 100 endpoints in a synchronized manner from East to West. And then you know, the network guy goes, oh, no, you don't do that. <laughs> because every time they try and change more than one endpoint at a time, it screws up. And that's because the, whole, the, DN, the APIs that a lot of these DNS vendors use are really designed with the mindset of somebody occasionally makes a change and then sits back and waits for it to propagate. And then you make another small change. And the APIs are just horribly broken. Um, the, the one you can reliably move in bulk is actually, that, we, that Netflix found was actually Route 53. Yeah, API driven. It's designed to do that. You send it an update, boom, it does it. Right? You can send it a combined update. It's like a big JSON, whatever. And it will update itself. And you, so you could actually synchronize the switching. And so Netflix ended up using Route 53 as the switching layer. But at the time, Route 53 didn't have direction, directional DNS, which looks up the IP address of your geography and says, this state goes east, this state goes west. So they used underneath that uh, Ultra or Dyn in a static configuration to do the geographic split. So since then, AWS came out with, hey, we do geographic split too now. So you don't need the Dyn and Ultra stuff. You can do all this with Route 53. But if you're building an, a, a, a load balancer, you want to make it generic. And I'd really recommend look at Denominator, because it just abstracts the whole problem into, OK, you have another DNS vendor, just add another plugin. And then behind that, you need an SSL endpoint. You need local load balancing in the zone or the region. You know, within that data center, which is perfect for Nginx. And you need some proxy filtering and, and tweaking. And maybe you, you take the URL and you rewrite it a bit. And you send this part of the URL to this service or whatever. So that, that's kind of what it takes to build an ELB. And the components are out there. What's needed is now like a little wrapper around this. So I'm hoping that Nginx or somebody will build that wrapper. So that's all fine. But 
how do people want to consume this nowadays? Well, I, I was talking about microservices and Docker. I want to just go to Docker Hub and download the Nginx, you know, configured to be this thing or whatever it is. Um, think of Docker Hub as the app store. Like, how are most people going to be consuming your product? They're not going to go to GitHub and download it and compile it. They're probably not going to come to your website and download the product and install it. They're just going to reference the image on Docker Hub and pull in whatever's there. Right? You're already starting to see this. This is an emerging behavior. You're, not everyone is doing this. But think of this as, in a year's time, this will be how everything's delivered. So what you have on Docker Hub matters. And I noticed that Nginx is now curating the, their copy you know, the official Nginx build, but it's just like a standard build and then you configure it. There should be every way you want to use it should be a separate thing there. There should be a whole, you know, this is the load balancer version, this is the proxy version, this is the static web server version with all the right tuning. So it's just off the shelf. You don't have to think about it. So recommend you spend lots of time curating what you have on, on, on Docker Hub and whatever you build, this is going to quite likely, you know, I'm just sort of predicting the future here, but I think this is going to turn into something like the App Store for iOS and Android. It's like the way you get apps for your phone. You don't go and fuss about anywhere else. There's a standard place. So we also now have to integrate with all the orchestrators. So you know, Mesos needs to know how to deploy Nginx as part of an old ecosystem because there's all these containers and you need to do load balancing across them. So you, you're going to want to use something like, like uh, Nginx to do that. Um, but there's lots of different orchestration frameworks and they're emerging. So you just have to go and figure out how to integrate with all the ones that matter, right? And eventually maybe there will a few, of, a handful of them will turn out to win, but there isn't really a winner right now. Um, configuration, completely dynamic. These containers are appearing and disappearing by the second, right? So if you have to go and edit a config file, that's not working. I noticed that there's some dynamic update stuff in um, part of part of Nginx Plus, I was sort of rummaging around on the website, trying to figure, doing some research for this talk. Um, that stuff needs to be easier. It needs to be more API driven, right? You need to be able to control and dynamically create and, and manage everything and make this as easy as possible. One of the reasons Docker spread like wildfire is that it was trivially easy to use. It did something useful for you in seconds, right? So if, the closer you can get to that, the better. All right, so that's my lecture on what to do. <laughs> uh, so just to summarize this talk, it's, it's really about getting your concerns separated correctly. Build these microservice teams that can work independently and have the right bounded context. And there's a few things that I keep seeing recurring over time. One of them is that, this is just, just sort of a final sort of wrap up. Um, I see all these companies coming in saying, hey, we built a new product. It's a service. It's a whatever. It's a, it's a whatever it is. And about three quarters of them are written in Go nowadays. This is like a big change from last year. You know, Docker's written in Go, uh, AppSera's written in Go, Cloud Foundry's being rewritten in Go, uh, Vivid Cortex, SaaS vendors being written in Go. It's like almost everything that arrives turns out to be written in Go. There's a few bits of Scala and there's some Java and there's some whatever and Python, PHP, but this is, this is dominant. The other thing is what's really going on in enterprise, and this book summarizes it. Lean enterprises are adopting continuous delivery DevOps and lean startup at scale. And this is a massive opportunity. They, they're retooling everything they, need, they know is wrong. And then this whole move from monolithic to microservices. All right, I don't know if I ran over time, but OK. Um, so I'm, I've done a whole bunch of talks this year. There are videos available for a bunch of conferences. You can deep dive on you know, monitoring tools or or the developer version of this talk that goes into a lot more sort of how to do microservices. And I'll be at reInvent um, and DockerCon Europe and a few other things over the next few months. So happy to chat and connect to me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or, or whatever if you want to discuss things. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.